Uh, okay, so I want to start off by saying I, I the Yomi is, um, it's been explained to you, but it basically takes about seven and a half years. Um, we're now about five years into it, into a cycle. Um, I did not start at the beginning. I started about two years ago. And it has changed my life. <clears throat> changed my life. Um, and just to give you confusion before I sort of start, just give you a sense, nobody knows this, my, my colleagues don't know this either. Um, David Berman in our group told the story about Rabbi Wasner, a Wasner who, who, who became the Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva, I guess, Bachmil who went in, 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 in B'nai Brach. He was the Talmud of, of Rameer Shapiro, and he failed his failed his test to get into the yeshiva. Um, so he, I actually forget about this, but I technically failed my entrance exam into YU's visa. And Rabbi Harlam, Zeker uh, Tzadik Baraka, who was the person who was giving the, the tests, he, he said, I have faith that you will that you will make the rabbi, and so we'll, you know, um, we'll let you in. And thank God I did it. Well, I did, did much better on my test in during Sleepa than I did before. But I start that way actually to say that Yomi, I did not believe was in my future even during Sleepa, and even after Sleepa, and even having practiced as a rabbi for, for many years. So the fact that I'm able to do this here is sort of, is mind-blowing for me. Uh, I want to talk to you about Dafyomi in three ways. One is content of the Gemara. Two is just the process, sort of like what Gemara is. Um, and for that, I'm actually going to uh, ask a few people to uh, help me with that. <laughs> And then the last is just what it's done for me personally. So let's just start with the content. Uh, today's daf is um, Hey Gimel in Bavi Metzia, and that straddles the sixth parak and the seventh parak. In other words, um, it's the, the sixth parak ends yeah, on this daf, and the seventh parak starts. So the end of the sixth parak has an interesting story of. Uh, Rabbi Barbar uh, Bar Hanan, who um, hired his workers to transfer. He was, a, he was in addition to being a scholar, he was a, he was a businessman. He hired porters to move bottle, barrels of wine, and in the middle of the trip, they break, uh, they break a barrel or two. And Rabbi Bar Hanan takes their, their, their coats, um, as like sort of collateral, like you broke my things, I'm going to take your cloaks. I'm going to take your cup, your 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 uh, your covers. So they go to Rob and they say, "Is that is that allowed?" And Rob actually says, "No." And he tells Rabbi Barachanan to return the coats. Uh, return the cloaks. While they're there, they say to him, "By the way, Rob, we're also." very poor, and we can't really afford to live without the wages. They don't really deserve the wages because they broke the barrels of wine. That was their job. But he tells them about Hanan, you'd have to pay their wages anyway. Can't take the folks as collateral. Has to pay their wages even though they broke the barrels. So Ramabar Hanan says to Rob, Dina Hachi, is this really the, the halakha? And he says, yes. Why? Really, the halakha, according to the Torah, is no. You don't have to pay the wages. You don't actually have to give back the cloaks. But Rab basically said, you are different than other people. You are a Talmud You are a distinguished person. You've reached a certain level. There are some different reasons why exactly, but the rules are different for you. And while it's not for others, it wouldn't be an obligation. For you, it is an obligation. 
if you have reached a certain level where more things are obligated, more things are asked of you. So I thought a little bit about this. What does that do with anything? Um, I think this trip for you and for us, you guys in this moment are Rabbi Bar Bar Shai. Because you are, as much as you're sitting around with you know, 52, of you, everyone's with 52 of your classmates, you think everybody comes from Poland, you think everybody does this, the answer is a very, very, very small percentage of people do this. We are here, and as, as us being here, you now have a new obligation on you to be a witness and to tell the stories for survivors, the survivors of whom will not be here, unfortunately, probably in the next 10 um, and 15 years. So you, other people who have not been here don't have as much obligation as you. You now, having been here, you now have an added obligation. You're different than other people, and you have an obligation to communicate and tell the story as if you knew more, as if you know more, as if you feel more because of your experience here, and the experience only gets more intense from here as you go to as we go to Majdanek, as we go to Auschwitz um, tomorrow. So. You have an added obligation that others do not have. Content. Okay. Process. I'm using an unusual book. This is not a reshow, this is not an opera, this is a very big, very, very late opera. Um, a Dara Horn, professor, uh, Harvard professor, writer. Some of you read this book in Dr. Lapsin's class. Um, I picked it up because it's about anti Semitism, and I, I, I read it before, I thought it would be good reading while I'm here, and I just opened one of the pages that I had flipped, that I had dog eared, and um, found, from, was reminded that at the end of this book is about Dara Horn starting Dafya. Um, and she describes it, and I asked three people to read excerpts, so if I could get, please. Um, Everybody, Lily and Anna and Ariel, please come up here for a second. Hey, Lily. Um, okay. <laughs> they're gonna read. They're gonna read short paragraphs here, Lily. I think you're first. Try to listen to what Dara Horan gets out of out of Gemara. Remember that she. Remember she's writing the book about anti-Semitism, and then at some point. She goes from the gatherings, the anti-Semitic gatherings, to the gather, gathering of the Siyum Hashas, of the completion after seven and a half years in MetLife Stadium, and she starts out filming. So three excerpts, excerpt number one. Something magical happened when I switched over from looking online at news reports about anti-Semitic attacks to joining online doc filming discussion groups and looking up doc filming reviews. The algorithms all caught on instantly, and suddenly I saw nothing on Visceral and physical process involving livestock and grain and wine and incense and fire and smoke. 
There was nothing metaphorical or intellectual about it. Even the location itself was mandated by God. After the Romans destroyed this temple and exiled the people, there was no particular reason for this religion, or even simply this people, to survive in any form. But on the eve of the temple's destruction, one sage, Rabbi Yosef ben Zaken, had himself smuggled out of the besieged city of Jerusalem in a coffin, after which he convinced the Roman general, Vespasian, to allow him to open an academy for poor scholars in a small town far from Jerusalem. Both Rabbi Yosef ben Zaken and Judaism faked their own death in order to survive this tactic. Both Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and Judaism faked their own death in order to survive this cataclysm. Sur survive this cataclysm. <laughs> the small cataclysm. Is that This is my favorite line in this, in this reading. But listen. Just listen to this line. Uh, by turning it into a virtual reality system, spacing temple rituals, equally ritualized blessings and prayers, studied Torah, elaborately regulated interpersonal ethics. The, the sages frantically arguing about when and how to recite which prayers are survivors and descendants of survivors, remnants of a destroyed world. They are anxious about remembering every last detail of that lost connection to God, like mourners obsessing over the over the tiniest memories of the remnants they have lost. One might expect that this memory would merge with faith, that people would move on. Instead, the opposite happens. Once the process of memory becomes enforced, the details do not fade, but rather uh, because this, Because the memory itself is something intrinsic, enriched by every succeeding generation that brings the new meaning to it. I, I, I love the idea of. I love the idea of rabbinic Judaism, the way we practice being virtual, like the virtual reality of the ideal, which was Judaism with the Beit HaMikdash as the, as the center. Much shorter paragraph. Thank you, Ariel. Last paragraph. Um, the comforting thing about the Bible study, the doctrine in this particular, is that you're never alone. Online, instead of people yelling at one another, where they were writing, Dr. would learn to gather to ask one another what this interpretation is, whether this interpretation works, what the deeper meaning is. I am stunned by these strangers, by the sincerity and candor, qualities one rarely encounters today, online or off. To my opinion, many are not Jews in the process of converting to this voluntarily joining this journey, even in the darkness. To my even greater amazement, one of my fellow Dr. Only learners is my mother, the world's least pedantic person, who signed off and has shown no sign. Wow. So, content in terms of Gemara, holier but familiar, virtual, describes the virtual reality of the way, we, the way we live right now, and connects us to others, right? Everybody, there are hundreds of thousands, just like tefillah, just like prayer, connects us to others, because when we say, when we read our Siddur, we're saying the same tefillah, more or less, as every Jew around the world, so too being on the same page at the same time as hundreds of thousands of Jews all around the world also connects us um, to all those people. So, number one, content. Number two, process and what Gemara is. And number three, just personal. Um, as I said to you before, I, I did not think I would ever do this. Um, it's a little bit like when I go to the marathon. And I see people running the marathon, and I say, oh my god, I'm totally doing this next year. And then, of course, I don't do it next year because I just can't. I just can't. I used to say that about... One day or two. Yeah, they want to one day I used to say that about, about learning Dafyomi also. How could I possibly do that? Um, and then one day I said, you know what, I'm just going to do this. And I started waking up, like, when, when in my day am I possibly going to do this? Um, I struggled to get out of bed in the morning, and I, I now uh, get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, when I pretty much, my train isn't until 7.09, but I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I get from about 5.15 in the morning to about 6.15 in the morning, I get an hour of total quiet in my house, um, and I spend roughly 45 minutes to an hour um, 
learning to die. I, if you know me, um, I, that, I, that's just, if you said to me two and a half years ago that I would be getting up at five o'clock in the morning and functioning and being like, able to, to do something rigorous, I would have told you that you're totally crazy. And I think what that has taught me is number one, that I am capable of more than I thought I was. Um, which I think is, yeah, that itself has been life changing. And then one other thing which is, I think it has taught me also that I am capable of change. Sometimes we think that change happens sort of at your age. And that's when you sort of have the most change. But as you get older, you get into your routine, and you start a family, and you, you just become an adult, it sort of plateaus, and you think to yourself, oh, I really wish I could do that, uh, who am I kidding? I really wish I could, I could stop speaking as much Lashon HaRa as I, as I do. Nah, who am I kidding? I really wish I could learn more. Who am I kidding? I really wish I could, I guess at some point, I could, I could exercise. Nah, who am I kidding? I'm not all of a sudden gonna start something at age 52. And the, whatever it is, it, it, it happens to be that Yomi, but the fact that at age 52, I was able to make such a huge change has actually led me in other areas to realize I can do this and make other subtle changes. So it's been an unbelievably enriching experience. One, because of the content. Two, because of the process. And three, because of how it has taught me um, what I'm capable of and that we don't stop changing and we don't stop learning um, ever. Um, and, but we learn and we change and we grow um, every day of our lives. Um, and may, uh, may, may, may you continue to grow and always be people who are learning um, and growing, whether it's Dr. Yomi or whether it's something else. Um, in college and beyond, um, as as adults.